Uh, Derek, welcome to Movie Junk. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Super excited to have you on. Um, you know, we have director, producer, writer, uh, and actor, uh, Derek Wayne Johnson, who's the man behind the uh, new hit documentary, uh, Stallone. Uh, Frank, that is, uh, based on the life of Frank Stallone. Um, available on Amazon, uh, Prime, uh, Google TV, and multiple platforms. The, the fan in me wants to just jump right into what it was like kind of making the, uh, the documentary, um, but really just want to spend some time kind of learning uh, a little bit more about you, kind of what got you started in the business, uh, maybe what were some early inspirations to, uh, that got you started. Well, first I have to correct something. Former actor. I, uh, I, I, I used to act, and I'll get into that, but uh, I haven't acted in, you know, like a decade. I gave it up. So, uh, but that certainly was one of the reasons I got my foot in the door in Hollywood. But talk about inspirations and and uh, how I got started. Uh, well, I've been wanting to be a filmmaker my entire life, and you know I, I've told this story before. But the first movie I remember seeing in a movie theater was The Karate Kid Part Two. I was three years old. And I was just like, whoa, what is this? And so I got into John Avildsen's films, Rocky, The Karate Kid, you know, Spielberg, the whole thing. I mean, in the VHS, you know, home movie, the, the rental store era, that's what I was in. And um, just, I knew at three years old, I wanted to make movies. And went to, started making movies in high school. Then I went to film school. And then I got my foot in the door and, 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 bigger projects. And, you know, you can tell by my shirt that, by the way, I did this documentary. I don't know if you've seen it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. Uh, 40, 40 years of Rocky, the birth of a classic. Rocky was a huge influence and, you know, we'll get into the Stallone thing. I'm sure that's why we're here today. And it's just been a crazy roller coaster ride since I was three years old. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, the fans and we actually have interviewed quite a bit of the Karate Kid and uh, Cobra Kai uh, cast. So uh, John Abelson's name is no surprise. Obviously, the director of the uh, first Rocky movie and Rocky Five, but also uh, the director of Karate Kid One, Two, and Three. And uh, yeah, you mentioned Karate Kid Two. I kind of go back and forth between Karate Kid One and Two as far as which ones are my all time favorites. But just that trip to Okinawa, and you were three years old, um, so I'm imagining, I mean, now there's probably some, some vivid memories that you had as a kid, and I'm sure you saw it over and over again as an adult. Well, it, uh, a cool story about that. And by the way, Karate Kid 1 is my favorite, but I really love to. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but I did a documentary on John Avildsen. Yeah. It's called John G. Avildsen, King of the Underdogs. And at the premiere, um, it was so cool. John had been a huge part of the movie. He had seen it a hundred times. He'd given me a thousand notes, but when we had had a few screenings and this and that film festivals, but at our world premiere, it was at the Santa Barbara film festival. And, um, it was so cool. My girlfriend at the time, she was cool enough to, she sat me in between Tamlin Tamita, who's a friend of mine, and Ralph Macchio, who's a friend of mine, and she kind of set it up on purpose. And I was like, Tamlin, Ralph, this is so crazy because your movie, Karate Kid 2, was the first movie I saw in a theater or that I remember seeing in a theater. So to have you guys here for this world premiere 30 some odd years later is blowing my mind. And it was just a cool experience because, you know, you're three, and then now all of a sudden you're in your thirties and you're friends with these people and you're making a movie with these people and a documentary about the director of that movie that inspired you. And, and then you're sitting in between them. It was mind blowingly awesome. Too bad that relationship didn't work out, but uh, she was cool enough to make sure I had a cool seat. That's insane. I mean, re regardless, I think the, uh, you know, the, uh, the torch was kind of passed. I mean, you got a chance to kind of sit with, you know, all these different legends. And uh, I mean, it's no surprise now, uh, you know, the, the, who played Kumiko and obviously, you know, Ralph who plays Daniel in Cobra Kai, you know, she's back. She made her come back in Cobra Kai season three. Uh, would you ever imagine that we'd be seeing, uh, you know, her again back in uh, the Karate Kid world? No, it's again, just mind blowing. The whole show is incredible. I remember one time though, um, me and John Avildsen and, Martin Cove and William Zapka were having lunch 
and they were talking about like an idea they had. This is not the Cobra Kai show that you see for the record, but they were talking about another idea that they had and John was digging it. John passes away. All of a sudden these, these writers come in and these creators of Cobra Kai and then not their idea, but this idea happens. And I'm like, oh, if John were alive to see this, he would just be, again, you mentioned Tamlin, Yuji. I mean, all these people coming back, John really would have loved that show. He really would have. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Since you had such a close relationship with uh, John, as, you know, what would you think, uh, what would he think as far as what his baby has become? And uh, yeah, definitely. I think there's no doubt on anyone's minds that he'd be he'd be proud just to kind of see how that universe has evolved. Uh, I never thought that I would ever see, uh, you know, because I'm a huge Ralph Macchio fan. I mean, I love my cousin Vinny, um, you know, and all the all the work he did in the '80s, obviously. But I never thought after Karate Kid three that we would ever see him come back. And same with uh, with William Zabka, you know, seeing him come back as Johnny, and um, just how the the roles are kind of reversed, but obviously evolved uh, to to much of an extent. So yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, they were able to bring this back and how, I mean, it was on YouTube first and then it rolled into Netflix earlier uh, this year, but uh, it just reached such a wider audience now. Um, Cause folks are like, have you seen, you know, the Cobra Kai? I'm like, man, I've been telling you guys how good the show was. Yeah, like exactly. I mean, but it was just this handful of people. Like you really had to be a fan to know about it. Yeah. And like you said, now everyone gets to see it and see how marvelous it is. I mean, it is a fantastic show. It just hands down, it's just, it's fantastic. Yeah. And um, as we mentioned, obviously John directed Rocky One and, uh, and Rocky Five, and just kind of going into Rocky right now, you mentioned, you know, which was your favorite Karate Kid movie. You know, I was gonna ask, what's your favorite Rocky movie? Part one. Always one, absolutely. Actually, Rocky and the Karate Kid are my favorite of all time, they, they're tied for first place, those two movies. I can't have one without the other. Yeah. So um, if you were like, what's your top three favorite movies? I have four. Like I can't, you know, um, Rocky one is just, uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful movie. The way John shot it, I mean, what he did with hardly any money, you know, a million dollars, but still not a lot of money for a studio picture. It's just incredible and Sylvester, Oh man, the script he wrote. It's just, it's just a phenomenal film. And, and that's kind of what led to 40 years of Rocky, which came out in the 44th year. We just didn't change the title, but uh, yeah, it, it, it uh, th this little unofficial trilogy I kind of have going on with King of the Underdogs about John Ableton, 40 years of Rocky, the birth of a classic with, with Stallone. And then Stallone, Frank, that is, it's like this weird little world that I've been living in for several years. And, you know, I'm kind of pigeonholed. I'm kind of stereotyped as a documentary guy or a Rocky Stallone Karate Kid Ableton guy. I get it. But it's kind of cool. It's like years from now, I can be like, I did that, that and that. And they all kind of tie together. Yeah. So you definitely just led into my next question. Do you think we'll ever see you direct a Rocky movie? Well, you know, probably not, but it's crazy. Like, I really want to direct a Cobra Kai episode. I haven't put my name in the hat yet, but I really want to. And I have told Stallone, I'm sly, I'm like, hey, man, I want to direct a Rocky movie. He's like, you know, it's, it's probably, yeah, it probably wouldn't happen. But, like, even if I got to do a Karate Kid movie, something, something in those in the in the in the Avildsen universe, let's call it that. I would be happy, and they all know I want to do it. But who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely kind of possible, you know, with how the story because Rocky's story is essentially closed right now with the way Creed two ended. But with one door closing, another opportunity opens up because Creed three, I think, is going to be more Adonis focused. So who knows? You know, I know you know there's some rumors that uh, you know Sylvester was thinking about maybe. Um, you know, extending the Rocky story again. So who, who better than, uh, than you? I mean, you did the 40 year documentary, you know, you interviewed, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, you made the documentary on Frank Stallone as well, who you know, is a prominent character in Alma. I think he was in Rocky one, two, three. I mean, and he had his, you know, taste in all the Rocky uh, movies as well. But uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's your opportunity to make a Rocky movie. Dude, 
Thank you. I, I mean, just to hear you say that, I'm going to send this to Sly and be like, hey, see, he said it, let's do it. So, but yeah, I appreciate that. What, what's it, or actually, how did you, um, you know, convince, because I know Sylvester, I mean, he narrated most of the 40 year anniversary. How did you convince him to uh, make the documentary on the 40 years of Rocky? I didn't. It was his idea. Oh, awesome. Uh, so, uh, my producing partner, Chris May, and I, and Frank, we went to Sly's house because, you know, Sly's in King the Underdogs and he was like, bring it over. I want to see it. And it hadn't come out yet. This was in 2016, which is the 40th anniversary of Rocky, as you know, or was. And uh, as soon as the credits rolled, Sly leans into his chair and he's like, I have an idea. And I guess while he was watching King the Underdogs, he was kind of sizing us up and he said, I have an idea for a 40th anniversary documentary da, 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 da. you guys do it. I'll narrate it, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Well, it took a couple of years to get things going, even though it's a 30 minute documentary, which was Sly's idea, by the way, he was like, you know, it wasn't working at 60 minutes. It wasn't working at 45 minutes. He was like, make it a solid 30. A lot of fans are mad about that, but they don't understand what goes into it. But anyway, uh, it works at 30. So it was his idea. And unfortunately, it took four years to come out. We just didn't change the, the title, but that was his idea. Crazy. And I mean, this documentary, I mean, it won a ton of awards. If I'm not mistaken, it won. It was the best short film at the Beverly Hills Film Festival, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a prominent award. Well, yeah, yeah. It, what's, what's crazy is, if, if I may say, we actually won that we won best documentary for King of the Underdogs. We won best in 2017. We won best short documentary for 40 years of Rocky. And at the same time, won best documentary for Stallone Frank that is at the Beverly Hills Film Festival. So whoo, three for three on that one, man. That was that was pretty wild. Yeah, and, and I have to admit, and it's not just because, you know, I, you know we had the privilege of interviewing Frank um, as well. Um, but I've actually watched that documentary three times. Um, so I did see it, uh, you know, when it first came out. And, uh, you know, because uh, now it's uh, for the fans that don't know, I mean, it's free. If you have Amazon Prime, boom, you can go in and watch it. So everyone should see it. I highly recommend it. And uh, what was kind of unique about this documentary is that it really had more of a film feel. It wasn't like a regular documentary. It felt like I was watching uh, a movie. And I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you probably had uh, the, the most fans kind of give that same type of response as well, or was that the goal of it was to kind of make it more film based instead of just a traditional documentary? Yeah, actually it's, it's cool that you brought that up. That's actually, so I'm a filmmaker. I make films and feature films, nothing you've ever heard of. And I hope you haven't seen them, but, and, and I will again, but I got into this documentary world through John Avildsen. So my goal was to make each documentary I make feel like a movie because that's actually what I do. So that was the intent. Now, you know, critics, critics are split on Stallone Frank that is because some feel it's a generic talking heads, you know, documentary and it, it isn't provocative enough, I guess. But then others like what you just said, they actually get what we we're trying to do here. And I'm on that side of things. I'm like, you know, we, we, it, we intended it to feel like a movie and it feels like a movie. Of course, it's full of talking heads, but, um, you know, they tell the story. So why not? Yeah. I know one of the things that Frank mentioned is that uh, during the filming of this uh, film, uh, he never was privy to meeting any of the, uh, the guests. So uh, kind of what was that process like as far as, you know, because there's a wide range of singers, actors. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger's in it. His brother, obviously, Sylvester's in it as well. Um, you know, what was it like, uh, you know, just kind of interviewing everybody and, uh, you know, Frank not meeting any of these folks during the filming? Well, it, it makes it easier on me, the director, and on, you know, the producers and everything that, that Frank wasn't there. But also what it really does is it makes it easier on the interviewee. Because if Frank is in the room, then they may not be honest. You know, they may, they may not open up enough. They may get distracted. So you, you don't want your subject of your documentary at the interviews. He was at one, but he wasn't in the room. 
Uh, he was at Richie's Sambora's. He, we, he hadn't seen Richie in a while. So we drove out to Richie's and he went into another room. Um, I think a couple we shot at Frank's house of his bandmates, he went upstairs into another room. But he was never right there because that's the interviewees, it's not fair to them. So uh, that was interesting. That, but for the most part, for 90% of the interviews, we went just did them on our own and he wasn't in, in the house at all. So uh, yeah, it, it, work, it always works better that way, I think. Yeah, one of the, um, the messages or you know, what, what Sylvester said, and it really, really just resonates is where he says, uh, you know, Frank is every bit as talented as I am. And uh, those are really, really strong words. Because I mean, Stallone is, you know, Sylvester is seen as one of the greatest actors of all time. He's actually on my Mount Rushmore of actors. Um, and just to, to hear that statement as well, and it really, really was uh, very strong to hear. And I think it's just, you know, something that truly resonates how talented uh, Frank is. Absolutely. Uh, not to take away from this moment that, that Sly said, this nugget of gold, which was amazing. But he also surprised me on King the Underdogs. So Sly has surprised me twice now. Well, obviously he narrated 40 Years of Rocky, but which was full of surprises. Well, I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. But in King the Underdogs, Sly actually says, uh, and I haven't seen it in a while, but he says something like, I couldn't have, and he pounds his fist, I couldn't have found a better director for Rocky. He was perfect. Talk about Avildsen. When John saw that, he got emotional. And John only really got emotional about his movies. In real life, he didn't really get emotional. He got emotional. So that was gold. Cut to a few years later when we interview Sly for Stallone Frank, that is. And he says that. He says, you know, he's just as talented as I am in, in what he sets out to do or whatever it was. And I, I can remember hearing a pin drop. I was like, whoa, gold, gold. And by the way, I'm remembering now, Frank was there at Sly's house, but in another room. And he was at Gold's Gym with, with Arnold, but whatever, standing over there working out. But anyway, um, Sly is great about having those little golden nuggets. He can give you you know, he can just give you whatever you need. You don't even have to really pull it out of it. Um, on 40 Years of Rocky, I remember, and, and I'm sorry, we'll circle back to Stallone Frank that is, but I remember I sent him some notes the night before, and I remember asking him prior to that, do you want me to script this out? And he goes, no, 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 I got it, I got it. All right. When we arrived to do the narration, he did it in one take. That's all, not ad lib, but that's just him flowing with it. He's genuinely narrating it in his man cave as it's up on the screen. And I had him, you know, I got to, I directed him. So he, I directed the intro, the outro, but the meat, that's all him. And I looked down at my notes, he hit every note. So again, kind of goes to show you how great Sly is on the fly. He just knows his stuff. Yeah. So yeah, when he said that, uh, I know it meant a lot to Frank because uh, I think Frank has said he's never heard his brother say anything like that to him before. That's insane. Yeah, it's, I mean, for, you know, just kind of going back to, um, you know, what you had just mentioned about uh, Sylvester kind of doing everything in one take, you know, you're, you're asking him to kind of talk about his baby, you know what I mean? So it's it was one of his children, so to speak. So it's like, he's going to be able to kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's a very emotional, he talks about Rocky kind of like this, this form, this like spirit, this like element that kind of is in every one of us. And it's, it's just one of the most, every, out of all the movies that he's done, when you hear him talk about Rocky, he gets very, uh, you see just the emotion kind of behind it. So, no, I mean, just, again, I, I loved, you know, the, the documentary, again, Rocky is one of my all-time favorites, and just kind of seeing kind of what went in, you know, uh, the process, and you mentioned that the first Rocky had literally no budget. I think they filmed it in like 28 days, 27 days. I think he even had the flu while he was making the movie and, you know, making the Frank uh, uh, Stallone documentary as well. Um, it was just awesome seeing, you know, Stallone kind of, you know, Sylvester come in full circle and, uh, you know, kind of tie everything back to just how talented uh, his brother is. And what, what fans, maybe the new generation doesn't really know is that during the, the late 70s and 80s, 
Frank Stallone was huge. I mean, he was, you know, on multiple soundtracks, um, the uh, Staying Alive album, um, you know, which he was nominated, um, you know, for uh, an Emmy, I believe it was, um, or I'm sorry, Golden Globe. Um, so it was just, a, Golden Globe. Yeah. yeah, so it was just a tremendous, um, you know, run for him. Tombstone was amazing. Uh, you know, I loved uh, that movie. It's for, for me, you know, kind of my, uh, you know, Western movies are Unforgiven and Tombstone, you know, Tombstone's amazing with Val Kilmer. Um, so it was just amazing to, uh, to watch. And uh, what I did want to ask is, because I, I sense that you're just as big a fan as all of us when, when you're making, you're just a fan kind of living in this world and making these amazing documentaries. Um, was there any added pressure um, you know, just to, just to be behind, you know, getting the approval of the likes of Sylvester Stallone, you know, and Frank, you know, because Sylvester is a director, actor, writer, he does everything. So he knows exactly how, how these documentaries and films need to get done. But was there any added pressure just to make sure that to deliver something that was uh, to his approval? No. No. Because the reason I say that is it's my film. It's my vision of their story, whether, you know, all three, John, Sly, Frank. So it's, it's, there, there's no pressure because you have to be yourself. And I know these guys and they, they like me and they let me be myself and they know that I'm going to give them good work. Are they going to deliver a lot of notes? Yeah, usually. Um, but that comes with any territory. So there's really no added pressure. I feel that if they added pressure, then, you know, they know that it would, it would tie me up and, and, and the vision wouldn't come across that needs to come across. And Sly being a director, John Avildsen being a director, they know what I'm going through. So they let me do my thing. Um, Frank, a little different, because he's not a director, but what he was good about is he would say like, let's go to Sly's. He wants to watch a rough cut of Stallone Frank that is, he'll, he's gonna give you a bunch of notes. So Frank was good to know like, let me sit next to Sly, let Sly whisper some notes in my ear, which he did the whole 90 or 70, whatever minutes it is, 90 minutes, I don't know. And I took those notes and applied it to the film. So Frank was good about that. Um, and, and all three of them were great with, with notes for sure, but, but no added pressure, I don't think. And I think that's important. And you mentioned me being a fan. Of course I'm a fan, you know, why would I, you know, do these, these movies uh, or these documentaries, but you have to turn that away. You have to turn that off. Yeah. You have to be the director, the writer, the producer, the editor, it's your movie. And, and as long as you go in there knowing that and you, they're not gonna eat your lunch. If you go in there acting like a fan, first of all, the first rule in this business is don't be a fan, be a friend. There you go. So uh, I don't know, I just wanted to throw some of that out there for anyone that is gonna start doing this sort of thing. Just be one of them, don't be a fan. Save that for later. Yeah, no, that's that's because we do actually get a ton of folks, uh, aspiring actors. I actually have a passion for screenwriting as well. So, you know, I love, you know, just kind of hearing these stories from you guys, because I think uh, a lot of us do start off as fans. And then when you get the opportunity, it's like, what's the switch? How do you turn off the, the fan and going into that, you know, being a friend or even a, a consultant, you know, so to speak, you know, as far as, you know, being able to do, you know, what's best for the film. Um, do you do you have a preference as far as you know making you know, a feature film versus a documentary, or are they both just different uh, different tasks? Well, my preference is a feature film because that's what I have always. Again, I got into documentaries kind of by accident, and then they just kept coming. Um, but storytelling is storytelling. It doesn't matter what medium it is. So I treat each one kind of the same. Now there's different parts that go into them. For example, when you're doing a documentary, you're basically an investigative journalist, but instead of being, you know, on the six, your piece being on the, or your package being on the six o'clock news that night, it might take you two years or three years or a year to get it how you need it. Yeah. Um, a feature film, you write it, pre-production, production, post-production, post boom different than a, than, a, uh, than a documentary. But at the same time, 
you're telling the story A, B to C, act one, act two, act three. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but, but yeah, I do prefer feature films, but uh, I don't know. Documentaries are cool. You know, I'm still telling stories. Yeah. Is there a, a documentary of someone that uh, you haven't done yet that you still hope that you can do one day? Hmm. Might be a tough question. Uh, yeah, I won't say, but there are, there's, there's a few. Cause the, the idea is, you know, we started two companies, yeah. Cinema 83 Entertainment for feature films, Cinema 83 Documentary Films for documentaries. So we do intend to balance that. And um, so, yeah, there, there's some down the line and there's some that I'm attached to now. There's also features down the line. So, uh, yeah, but I can't say it. No, because I, I, lo I love your, um, you know, your directing style. So, you know, and, and the individuals that you've chosen so far, you know, John Abelson, you know, Frank and Sylvester, obviously with the Rocky series as well. So, you know, you're just touching on all my favorites. Uh, you know, movies and, and actors and, you know, just directors growing up. So um, I can't wait for the, for the next one. I'm probably going to message you some, but I say, Hey, I want you, I want to see if you can do one of these guys. Um, but no, just excited to, uh, you know, to see, you know, the, the uh, body of work that you've already done and excited to see some of the upcoming projects as well. Um, I did want to ask, cause when I actually do ask this question, um, usually more at the end of the interviews, um, separate from the work that you've done, what, TV shows are you binge watching nowadays? Wow, great question. Um, so I don't watch or binge a whole lot of TV. Uh, so this is my thing. I, I will answer your question. Um, so being a filmmaker, being a, a, a movie guy, I really love to watch and make serious movies. And then I like comedic television to just kind of like unwind. You know, so in the heyday of it's always sunny, the office, the league, that was like yeah. medicine for me. And then while, while, you know, I just watched the deer hunter, you know what I mean? So it's, it's like, that's how I, I, I like it. it. So all of a sudden things have changed with Netflix and whatnot. Now you binge a series. Yeah. Usually it's, they're serious. Right. And for me, it's like, it's hard because it's like, Oh, I'm over here watching The Godfather. Yeah. Now I got to binge a serious eight episode. It's hard. Yeah. So to answer your question, obviously Cobra Kai, Stranger Things. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the realm that, that I'm in when it comes to binging. But I really do need to get caught up on some other shows. Um, but it's just it's just hard to do, you know? I don't know. That's a long-winded answer. But then again, I think all of my answers – today or long winded no no definitely I mean, we, we obviously we, we want to hear you know hear these from you so i mean this is this is definitely your time but yeah stranger things is awesome i mean cobra kai you know the second the last episode ended i was like man i gotta wait a whole other year to get season four and there's a lot of you know rumors circulating you know but behind um you know if we're gonna get mike barnes back um you know some of the other characters that are going to come back next season that have been rumored so i mean I'm, i can't wait uh, definitely want to see you, you know, get into one of those future episodes They're saying they might aim for like six seasons. So uh, if not uh, season four, we definitely want to get you in for, uh, for season five. Hey, that would be awesome. I, I've been gun shy on just hitting them up and just kind of putting my name in the hat, but you know, I, I need to, I really, I, one episode, Yeah, you know, so. I mean, you got a great resume. I mean, they're, they're known as the big three, you know, Josh, uh, John, and Hayden. I mean, I'm sure you know exactly who they are. But, uh, yeah, definitely, I mean, we want to get you in to do a, uh, you know, who, who else, uh, you know, besides you to get in and do an episode. Um, and just lastly, you know, just to kind of um, be respectful of your time, um, did have one question from a fan that I wanted to uh, ask and just wanted to see if this was true. Uh, is it true that one of your earliest uh, inspirations uh, were from having a VHS tape of Raiders of the Lost Ark. I wish if I were upstairs in my office, I would reach over there and I would grab that tape to show you. Uh, I'm so tempted to run up there and grab it to answer that question visually. But yes. Um, that tape. So my mother bought it. Uh, it's an original. It's the first edition on VHS. So it starts out with 
a teaser for Temple of Doom. And it's like in the summer of 84, blah, 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 blah. So this tape, you know, obviously Raiders came out in 81. This tape is like, I think it's 82 or 83. I was born in 83. And it's telling you that Temple of Doom is coming in 84. So this tape, my whole life, I watched it over and over and over again. It would break. I would fix it. I would, you know, break in there, get in there, tape it, redo it, change the, the casing out. It has parts from different VHS tapes to keep it alive. This is pre-internet, pre-DVD, all this stuff. Oh, yeah. The case is long gone, or the cover is long gone, like disintegrated. It's just gone. So I just have this, this, this tape, and uh, I'm afraid to put it in a VCR because it might totally tear up. But that was the film that when I really knew, I mean, I mentioned Karate Kid and Karate and Rocky and all that stuff, but I want to make movies. And if I ever get to meet Steven Spielberg, if I know I'm going to meet him, I've got to have that tape on me to have him sign it. Because to me, that is the Holy Grail for my film collection, simply because of what it did for me as a, as a young kid. Yeah, and I, I imagine, I and mean, you probably already do this, but anytime, I don't know if it's uh, if when you're in a dark place or you need any added motivation, just go in and look at that tape and that'll give you all the uh, motivation that you need. Um, but no, that's, that's amazing. And I, you know, I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, sentimental, uh, you know, feelings that you have. And I mean, what, what amazing movie to, uh, to have that be kind of one of your early inspirations that's kind of helped spawn, you know, a, a tremendous career. And obviously, you know, there's, there's a ton of uh, more projects that you probably have in the works. And I, I mentioned, I'm going to, I'm going to message you some that I think that you should do a documentary on as well. Um, so Derek, just wanted to thank you again for, uh, you know, giving us some time. Uh, loved, loved the documentary, Frank Stallone, that is. Uh, and again, if you haven't seen it, folks, Amazon Prime, go on and watch it. It's free. I've already seen it three times. Just from talking about it now, I'm probably going to go watch it again right now um, over dinner. Um, thank you again for joining us again. And definitely want to do this again once your uh, next film comes out. Hey, thank you. And I mean, seriously, this was a lot of fun. I've been keeping up with your videos. And uh, you've got a great thing going here, man. You have some really good guests. The Frank thing was great. And uh, thanks for plugging the movie. And for everyone out there, just, yeah, you know, watch it on Amazon. Stallone Frank, that is. Awesome. Well, dude, I'm probably going to bug you. I'm going to ask you for a picture of VHS tape, holding it like this and <laughs> send it over. I'm so tempted to go get it, man. But, yeah, I'll send it to you. Derek, thank you very much. And thank you. Take care. Thank you. You too.